Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're here to worship with us and online this morning here at uh, Cedar Grove. The uh, wants to uh, be in prayer for this morning. Uh, Tabitha's mother, uh, she came home yesterday too, by the way, and just uh, be in prayer for that whole family. Uh, Mike and Donna, Chrissy, Catherine, and uh, Travis, just uh, uh, give a uh, special uh, prayer and just lift her up today. Uh, Catherine, she uh, supposed to have the, uh, the email that I got from, uh, or all of us got, uh, from uh, Marlene yesterday, I think uh, Catherine was supposed to have the procedure yesterday and is going to have it this morning at 11 a.m. So just uh, lift her up and keep her, her in your prayer this morning especially. Um, Anita and Marty, uh, one another, unspoken request. And I uh, still want to thank Marlene uh, for all the informative, informative and uh, uplifting uh, emails that she has sent out this week especially and every week and uh, thank our pastor for uh, Wednesday night uh, online Bible study appreciate him doing that so much appreciate both of them uh, our uh, songs today we've got a couple of songs uh, Blessed Assurance 334 and uh, Stand Up for Jesus uh, 485 will be our second one and then we'll uh, get Lynn up here for our special music and then uh, we'll get our pastor up here the message and the good news after that. <laughs> so let's uh, please stand uh, and turn to 334 for a blessed assurance. <laughs> Stand up for Jesus. What's on your screen?
need the perfect words, words to heal you, and no straight from you. I don't know what to say. I only know it hurts to see my only friend slowly fade away. So maybe this time I'll speak the words of life with your fire in my eyes. But that old familiar fear staring at my words. What am I so afraid of? Here I go again, talking about the rain, mulling over things that won't live past today. As I dance around the truth, time is not his friend. This might be my last chance to tell him that you love him. Here I go again. I dance around the truth Time is not his friend This might be my last chance To tell him that you love him Here I go again Talking about the rain Mulling over things That won't live past the day As I dance around the truth Time is not his friend This might be my last chance To tell him that you love him Thank you, Miss Lynn. Always good to have folks that want to share their abilities and talents to be a blessing. Amen. Thank you for that. Well, we've been in the book of Revelation, and you know, with the earth shaking today, it'd probably be a good place to be this morning, but uh, that's not where I'm going today. And uh, I, I had started working on our next message out of the book of Revelation, and, and uh, early on in the week, God just, he spoke to me through my devotions and through some things that I was seeing going on in the world, and um, I just got a different kind of message today. So I'm going to invite you, if you would, to go with me to the book of Job, chapter 6. Now, to help you find that book, if you'll just open your Bible up in the middle, you're probably going to be in Psalms. And if you'll go back towards the front of it, Job is that, that next book right before Psalms, chapter 6. Chapter 6. Let me say a, a, a few things to you about the book of Job, and then, then I'll, I'll give you my lead in on some things. Job is actually the oldest book in your Bible. I know you don't understand that, but it's actually the oldest book. Uh, now, it don't record the oldest information. Genesis records the oldest information. But Moses lived after Job's day. Job probably lived during the time of the patriarchs. Uh, Abraham, he was probably a contemporary to Abraham. And uh, this book was written by a Gentile. Job is a Gentile. And it's a book about suffering. It's about God's mercy, God's blessings. I mean, it, it is a, a very interesting book. It's called a, one of the uh, wisdom books. It's part of the wisdom literature in your, in your Bible or the poet, poetic part of your Bible. So 
Uh, that's just a little bit of information about it as you find your way there. So I'm going to guess that you're there, right? All right. Now, let me just say some things. Let me just be really honest with you. I like to read a passage of Scripture. I like to expand on that passage of Scripture. That's what I like to do. I think that's the way we ought to preach. That's not going to be my, my technique today. Okay? All right? It's just, it's just not. It's going to be an unusual kind of message. But it's just it's the way it lays out, and it's the way it's going to be today. And so y'all just have to put up with me, okay? Y'all can y'all can have a meeting and fire me afterwards. All right. Let me read you a list of names: Darren Patrick, Bill Zeller, Stephen Woolridge, Wendy O'Williams, Andre Waters, Ed Warren, David Foster Wallace, Dick Trickle. Tom Swishich, Marilyn Monroe, Ernest Hemingway, uh, Dimitri Bosvo, Steve Bing, Molly Brodak, Camelia Mara, uh, Maria, excuse me, Concepcion, Carolyn Flack, Sarah Hegiza, Salvo Horta, Pavel Jovanonic, Hannah Karuva, Stan Kurich, Hashu Kun Yan, Paul Lambert, Alona Luciana, Favio Migacho, Harmua Marua. Um, this one here I'm, I'm not going to get. Park Wusan, Rectful, Samara, Shimera, Kitstu, Megato, and Daisy Coleman. Now, who are all these people, and what do they have in common? From the few I heard, it sounds like they committed suicide. Every one of these people have committed suicide. Almost all of them in the year 2020. Not all of them, but almost all of them. Some of them are a little more famous, like people like Marilyn Monroe. It's almost 60 years ago, you know, she committed suicide. There are all kinds of people on this list. They are, there are musicians, there's actors, actresses, politicians, activists, athletes, billionaires, Olympians, writers, and even pastors. Famous pastors, by the way. They all have been touched by suicide. It's amazing how many people actually die of suicide, take their life each and every year. I mean, it really is. And it is something that you don't hear anything about from the pulpit. We don't talk about that. Uh, but it's a real thing. I mean, it's, it's a true to goodness thing. And this very week, there has been three famous people this very week that has taken their life. Okay. And like I say, as I was reading in my devotions this week, God just impressed this on my heart. Because of all the stuff that's going on in our world. I mean, people are depressed. People are worried. People are upside down about COVID, about the stock market, about everything else. If you look at these people here, and there's a list that you can go look at all these people. If you look at all these people here, almost every one of them, it'll say that they were battling depression. Almost every one of them. Well, that's going to be the reason that the world's going to give, and that's going to be the reason that most people are going to say, you know, they were battling depression. But I believe that the word depression is too broad. I believe it's just too broad of a, uh, of a word. A lot of people get depressed about a lot of different things. I believe everybody goes through depression at some point in time. I really do. 
Some people stay in it for a long period of time. So we need to ask ourselves, why did these people get depressed enough to take their life? I mean, I really believe that's what we need to ask. Uh, because these people here are at the top of the list on the pile. I mean, you can kind of understand somebody that's on the bottom of the pile. They get tired of being on the bottom of the pile. One of these guys was a billionaire. He jumped out of a, or off of a balcony. All right. These people are famous. Uh, they're, they're at the top of, the, of, of their game. Uh, so why did they kill themselves? I mean, they have money, they have fame. And there's been beauty uh, uh, ladies that have won uh, beauty contests. They have international recognition. Uh, in a lot of cases, they're athletes and they're at the top of their sports. They have free time. They have everything that everybody in the world wants. Well, they don't, but just because, I mean, there's some of them that do. Some of them were pastors that actually do. But, but, the, but the thing about it is, is what is it that causes them to get to that point? And more importantly, to those of you that's sitting right here and the people that's watching on that uh, internet right there, more importantly, what would put you to the point of committing suicide? Yeah, yeah. That's part of it. I want to look at that. I want to try to answer those questions for just a little bit. And, it, and like I say, it's going to be a different kind of message. Um, you know, so let me give you just a... Five things, before we get into Scripture, five things that I think that people uh, get to a point where they don't see no way out. Okay, five things. All right? Let me say this before I give you those five things. The air is thin at the top of the pile. You know what I'm saying? It really is. First thing, I think people are afraid of being forgotten. Okay. I really believe that. I believe there's a lot of people that just think that they, they're going to go off into oblivion and nobody's going to remember them. Now, y'all going to think this is funny, but you just, this is, this is the most crazy example that I can give you this morning of somebody that's famous that has to, that has to keep their self out there. The Kardashians. They have never done anything. I mean, they really don't need to be on, on the news. But on my Internet, if I was to pull up my Internet right now, my home page, uh, I'll guarantee you if you scroll far enough down through there, there'll be something about them on there. Okay? Now, I've never clicked on there and looked at, and read a whole article about anything, but let me just tell you what I know about the Kardashians. All right? About a year and a half ago, or two years ago, uh, they went up to see President Trump, okay? And that was a big to do, you know? And I mean, they just all kinds of stuff. They are, they're Republicans, supposedly. And so they went up to see President Trump. Well, that died out. Well, now you got COVID going on. And so uh, the next thing you know, they're over here. They done found religion. And, and they're off over at uh, Osteen's church, helping him have his thing. I want to tell you what. Now, y'all can, can hate on me all you want. I don't think you can find Jesus at Osteen's church. He don't talk about Jesus. Okay, he don't talk about the fact that you need salvation. He don't talk about the fact you're a sinner. You've got to get a sinner before you can find Jesus. I'm just going to tell you that now. But anyway, they, they, they were there. They did, did a service there. Now he was going to run for president because there wasn't nobody doing right. I just seen this yesterday. That's why I'm using them. Now they, they're having marital problems and they're going to go off down to the Caribbean and work on the marital problems. They have to come up with something all the time to keep themselves out in front of, of everybody because if they don't, they'll be forgotten and then they won't make any money. They, their life is about being on your internet, in your mind, in your life. they got to have you knowing what's going on with them all the time. And it's got to be a greater shock factor. 
I believe one of the things that causes people to, to commit suicide is they're afraid they're going to be forgotten. Let me just say this real quick. A lot of people that, that peak when they're in high school, do you know what I'm talking about? They were, they were, the, they were the star running back. They were the star football player. They were the star of whatever it was, and they peaked. And, and when they got out of school, they wasn't the top of the pile anymore. Nobody cared what they'd done when they was in high school. I think a lot of times they, they get to the point where they, they think they're going to be forgotten. I believe, first of all, now these aren't in any particular order. I believe people are afraid they're going to be forgotten. I think a second thing that causes people to contemplate or to commit suicide is sickness. If you've ever watched anybody go through cancer, and die from it. That's a that's a tough that's a tough disease. And there's other diseases out there just as bad. AIDS. There's all kinds of stuff that that. And I think when somebody a lot of times we I know we went to uh, high school. We have one teacher that had a brain tumor, and he suffered for over a year with that brain tumor, and he died. He finally died. And then there was another teacher that was his friend that was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and he committed suicide. Okay. He'd seen his friend die from it. A lot of times sickness brings people to a point where they'll commit suicide. I think a lot of times the death of a loved one. We, we, we miss them so bad that we just we can't get past that hurt. Death brings hurt. It does. I mean, it really does. I, I think about people that I know that have lost loved ones. Uh, I mean, we, we have... Friends and, and family that lost spouses and children and the death of a loved one. A lot of times loss of money. If you lose your money, people have their identity in their money. Hang on with me just a minute. I find my identity in a Harley Davidson. I find my identity in the boat I have. I find my identity in my RV. I find my identity in my second or third home. I find my identity in the clothes I wear. I find my... You, you see what I'm saying? And you lose your money, and all of a sudden you lose your Harley, you lose your, your car, you lose your, your, your boat, you lose your second home, you lose the clothes, and you lose your identity. You understand? There's a guy just the other, other week when the market fell so, so, uh, strong in one day, he was he was a brand new, brand spanking new uh, uh, investor, and he had made a bad investment on a lot of people, and he had lost millions, millions of dollars he had been entrusted with, and he went out and killed himself that afternoon. Okay, money, money causes people to commit suicide. Right here is probably, it probably has something to do with all of the above, but it's probably the biggest one. And it is embarrassment. I think people get so embarrassed. Something comes out that they've done or they've been accused of or whatever, or they're ashamed of whatever's going on in their life, and that embarrassment brings them to a point where they can't face reality anymore. And they go out and kill themselves. My daughter, I didn't even know there was such a thing. Y'all you know, just see how dumb your pastor is. My daughter, when she was pregnant, she got to talking about people baby shaming other mothers. I'm like, what kind of mess is that? Well, if you don't have the right baby seat, if you don't have the right baby bag, if you don't have the right baby carriage, you, you know, if your child ain't bare, I said, man, we used to buy, we used to go. Mm -mm. We used to go all, all to the flea markets and, and uh, all the yard sales and buy all these little quarter outfits. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, baby shame. I, I ain't crazy enough to give $50 for every outfit they're going to have on. That's right, they're going to outgrow it. So, 
I, I had never heard of such thing, but there's people that just become embarrassed about their position in life or, or what's going on with them. They can't afford to do something else. And they go out and they end their life. All of these things are true. I want to now get into Scripture, okay? And we're going to look at some things from Job. All right, now, if you don't know anything about Job, let me just give you this much about Job. Job was probably the most wealthy man in his day. Okay, probably the most wealthy man in his day. He was a religious man. He was a god fear. He had ten children. We're going to learn this. We're actually going to look at this in a couple of weeks when we get to Revelation chapter 9. We're going to actually probably come back to something here in the book of Job. But, but we see Satan's character in the book of Job in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now you listen to me. When the Bible says that you're, you don't wrestle with flesh and blood, you don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Satan is going around trying to find people to devour and destroy. You hear me? And he looked at Job and he tried his best to figure out a way to get an angle on Job. And finally, in a conference with God, when the angels of heaven were with God, he says, have you considered my servant Job? He said, I sure have. But he serves you for naught. You just got a hedge about him. I can't get to him. You take what he's got away from him, and he'll curse you. And God, God, gave, Job, uh, God, God gave Satan the ability to go take what Job had. What did he take? Everything but his wife and his life. He left his wife. He had a reason for that. And he left his life. And he had a reason for that too. He took ten children. Now, I, I, my friend Dexter, he's lost three. Okay? My friend Mike, he's lost two. Riesel Cox lost two and a wife. I mean, I know people that's lost one and two and three children. I had never known anybody to lose ten. Ten adult children one time, boom. He lost all of his ability to make wealth. All of his flocks, all of his herds, all of his servants, all of his camels, everything gone in one time, poof. And then that wasn't good enough. Satan goes back to God and he goes back and he attacks his body and takes his health from him. Now we're going to pick it up where Job is, his health is disintegrated before him. He's sitting in sackcloth and ashes at the end of the road. That's where he's sitting at. Where they take all the broken pottery and they throw it out there. And he's sitting in that broken pottery and he's scraping the sores on his body trying to get them off of him. Now that's where he's came to. That's where Job's at at this point in time. But are you with me there? I, I know that's been a big lead in. I promise you we won't be long. Okay? Look with me if you would. In chapter 6, now Job is going to answer one of his three friends here. He has three friends that comes and sees him. And he's going to answer one of them right here. But Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed, and my calamity laid in the balances together. For now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea, therefore my words are swallowed up. Job, right here in just this one little sentence, he says, this is more than I can bear. One of the things that brings people down to despair is the weight of all that's going on around them just gets to where they just don't feel like they can carry it anymore. He said, it's more than all of the sand in the whole world laid on top of me at one time. You know what, friend? You listen to me. We all get to times when we have burdens and we think that our burdens are the biggest burdens in the world and those burdens are, are weighing us down and they put our nose in the dirt. Amen? 
They do. There's two things I want to give you about that. First of all, the Bible says, cast all your cares on Him, for He careth for you. Okay? So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to say, I'm going to cast my cares up on God. Because I can't carry this thing. It's too heavy for me. It's breaking me down. The second thing you need to do, when you get to that point, when you think the weight of the world is going to shove your head down through the, through the ground, you just need to open your eyes and look around. Because I'll guarantee you, there's somebody that's got it a whole lot worse than you do. My wife, we've been up there and we're worried about her finger. And Lord knows, I don't want my wife to lose her finger. But when you look at people that have lost almost all of their fingers and they're not getting any better, and you look at people that's lost a lung, and you look at people that's lost a leg, and you look at people that's in a lot worse shape than you are that can't hardly come in, all of a sudden that finger don't seem quite as big as that. You understand what I'm saying? I don't want her to lose it. But all you got to do is look around and say, boy, they somebody got stuff a whole lot worse than me. Amen? Guess what? It allows you then to count your blessings. We sung that. It allows you to look around when you say, and you say, it could be a lot worse. I got it bad. I got, I, I'm crying. I'm depressed. I'm, I'm, but buddy, they somebody got a lot worse than me. One of the great things about the Bible, you listen to me. I wish I could get Christians to read the Bible more. I wish I could read the Bible more. But you know what happens? Now you listen. Oh, we're going to take a side trip here. <laughs> what happens with us is we get started. We're going, we're going to read the Bible, and it comes, it comes January 1st, and we're off work. We're going to read the Bible. And we start out real good. We'll get up there about halfway through Genesis. We'll get a little bit behind. Well, I'm about three days behind. You'll read, you know, and you, you'll try to stay with it. And then the first day you get over there in Leviticus, that's the end of that. Okay? I mean, I'm just telling you the truth, okay? Can I give you some help? This morning? Some of you are going to never listen to me again. That's fine. Let me give you some help this morning. I like my King James. A lot of people would do a lot better if they'd read something besides King James. It would be a little bit easier on them to read until they get through it the first time. Okay, I'm just telling you. Some of you never listen to me again. I know that. But I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you. You do well to read all the narratives. In other words, you read Genesis, Exodus. Skip Leviticus. Go, go, go over there. Skip all of the genealogies when you get over there to, to Numbers and pick up about Numbers chapter 8 and start reading and read uh, Deuteronomy and then read... Uh, Joshua and so on and so forth. And when you get up there to all, listen to me, when you get up there to all them prophets, skip over to Matthew. I'm just telling you, I'm trying to give you some good advice. And then you go back and, do you know why you don't like Leviticus? Let me tell you why you don't like Leviticus. Leviticus, the book of Leviticus is about being holy. And until you get a handle on what the rest of Scripture tells you about God and about you, you really don't understand what it's talking about, about being set aside. The Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am the Lord thy God am holy. Okay? So God expects you to be holy, but that book's all about being set aside. And I want to tell you, if you try to read it the first thing, you can forget it. I, I, I'm just telling you. God didn't put it there for you to read it the first thing. I'm just telling you. All right. Let's go on. Uh, more than I can bear. Uh, look, look with me in, in chapter 6, verse 11. What is my strength that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? Drop over, look in chapter 7, verse 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Let me tell you something, folks. Job got to a place where he didn't have no hope. He was saying, 
My hope's gone. Now, hope, and y'all hear me say this all the time, and if y'all don't ever, if I died today, if y'all don't remember anything else about Marty, you're going to remember what the word hope means. Okay? Hope is not, I hope I win the lottery. You wish you win the lottery, especially if you me, because I don't have a lottery ticket. So, I mean, it's a wish. I, I, I sure do wish I'd win that Powerball, but you've got to buy a ticket before you have any expectation of winning it, right? Well, I don't have a ticket. I'm not going to buy one either. They get enough taxes out of me. Y'all do what you want to. All right? How's that? Hope is not a wish. Hope is an expectation based on something. That's what the word hope means. Job had got to the point where he didn't have any expectation left. I've lost everything. I've lost my children. I've, lo I've lost all my cattle. I've lost all my servants. I I've lost my health. I don't, I've lost everything. I don't have anything else. He'd lost his hope. There's a lot of people today that don't have no hope. I just read, I've been reading a book on evangelism. I just read a guy, he was talking about one of the things that he likes to give people is, is a tract that says, do you need hope? Because this world needs hope. This world don't have any expectation. This is all they got. And so when the COVID comes along and they got to stay home and they can't go nowhere, and they, this is all they got. They've lost hope. As Christians, we shouldn't lose hope. We do, but we shouldn't lose hope. We've got an expectation. Let me give you another one here on hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. That is, a, that is one of your passages for your rapture. And Paul says, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. So he says... I wouldn't have you to be unlearned concerning them which have passed away. Okay? That you mourn not as others who have no hope. Okay? This world don't have no hope, no expectation of what comes after this. But as Christians, we have an expectation that the Lord will bring with them which are in Christ Jesus with Him when He comes and gets the rest of us. So we have a hope that we're going to see those loved ones again that die in Christ. Ain't that good? Amen. That's good stuff. We got, we got hope. We have an expectation based on something that's better than the price of gold this morning. We have an expectation based on God's reputation because God said it. Amen? That's an expectation now, my friend, this morning. Amen? Something else that happens when, you, when things are going wrong, I want you to look with me in chapter 7. We're over in chapter 7 now. Look with me in verse 3 and 4. So I'm made to possess months of vanity and wearisome nights are appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, When shall I arise and the night be gone? And I am full of tossing and to and fro and, and the dawning of the day. One of the things that happens, not only does people uh, feel like they got more than they can bear, not only do they have a loss of hope, but they also have a loss of sleep. I'm going to tell you what, when your mind gets troubled, you get to where you got a loss of sleep. Amen. I'm going to tell you what the psalmist says, I lay down and I take my rest. You know, why? Because God puts him at peace. But I'm going to tell you what, we let our heart get all troubled up sometimes and we, got, we just can't get the stuff off our mind. And when you get the stuff on your mind and you get to the point where you wore down, you can't fight those temptations anymore. You hear what I'm saying? Do you see what Marty's saying there? As you lose sleep, you start losing your rational mind. As you start losing your rational mind, you start losing your strength to be able to reason. You understand? I'm going to tell you what. Things get on our mind. It'll, it'll, it'll take you sleep from us. 
That'll cause you to get depressed. I'm boy, I've had times that don't don't look at me like I don't go through these things, okay? I've had times when I couldn't sleep to save my neck. Things just get so heavy on your mind of what's going on. Things are bad, things are tough. And, and you're just worried that you got so much going on in your life and you don't know which ends up. Amen? What happens? Lord, put my heart at peace. Turn my mind off. And give me sleep. That's hard to do. But that's what we got to do in order to get that rest. People that are depressed, people that are having a time, uh, they, they, they have a loss of sleep. Now I want you to look at one more thing out of chapter 7 and I'm going I'm to try, try my best to, to land this plane here in a minute. Chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou scarce me with dreams and terrify me with visions. People, when they start getting depressed, they get afraid. They're afraid of everything. They, this, they, they imagine stuff. Well, doggone so-and-so knows what I'm doing. They, they seen me. They, they talking about me over yonder. I'm going to lose this dollar. Oh, this is going to happen. If I do this, this is... Can I get an amen or oh me there? Okay. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. We can laugh about it. We've all done it. But it will bring you to a point where you depress, man, because you're worried about everything under the sun. And you just, you have all these dreams and, and visions in your head of what's going on in everybody else's world. And they probably don't eat, they're home sleeping. They ain't worried about you and your mess. <laughs> and if they ain't sleeping, they're probably worried about their own mess, not your stuff. How's that? But we get all tight and worried about all this stuff and our... we get afraid. We get afraid. I'm going to give you two things, maybe three. I hear y'all laughing at me. We read this a while ago. I want you just to hang on to it. In chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Even though even that I would please God to destroy me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. Job didn't consider suicide. Job wanted God to kill him. Remember Jonah? Jonah didn't want to kill himself, but he wanted God to kill him. He really didn't want to die, but he, he wanted God to kill him. Well, here again. Elijah was the same way. We got so many examples of different people. Now we have examples of people committing suicide in the Bible too. Okay. But but we have so many people that say, Lord, take my life. Do you know why they're saying, Lord, take my life? It's not theirs to take. It's the sanctity of life. Life belongs to God. Your life belongs to God. If it's a long life, if it's a short life, if it's a good life, if it's a bad life, our life, our very breath, belongs to God. Job understood that. So did some other people in the Bible. One of the reasons we shouldn't take our own life is it belongs to God to take. Okay, It belongs to God. Now, ah, man. I want you to look with me in chapter 7, verse 1. Is there not an appointed time to man upon the earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hireling? Here again, Job says, Life belongs to God, and my length of days belong to Him. How much I have. You know, we, we'll argue people shouldn't have abortions and sanctity of life and all that. Well, you shouldn't kill yourself either. It's the same thing. It's the sanctity of life. It belongs to God. Marty, you just don't know what I'm going through. No, I don't. You're right. I do not. And I'm sure that your weight is heavier than anything that I've ever had, at least in your mind at this moment in time. 
But it's still God's life. And what you're going through is so he can help you help somebody else along the way. Do you know that? God's given me all this education. I, I ask him all the time, Lord, why, why do you give me a, a love for going to school? I don't need all this education. I can read books, but he gives it to me. And he gives it to me to help others. I, I see it all the time. I mean, there's just people that just out of the blue, he'll put in my, in my path and they'll ask me something or they'll give me an opportunity to talk to them about something. And the next thing you know, some point of education that I had somewhere 20 years ago comes out of my mouth. God puts us through what we go through to refine us and make us a, a vessel that is precious and valuable to His service. You never know when that person that you help is going to be the next D.L. Moody. We, we look at our life and we think, well, I ain't done nothing. I live in Randolph County. <laughs> well, guess what? That's where God wants you to live at. He's got a work for you to do in Randolph County unless He moves you to Davison and then I don't know what you're going to do over there. But, <laughs> but Oh, I know that was going to get some people. <laughs> oh, me. Listen to me. What you need today, if you're down in the dumps, if you're depressed, what you need today is you need to find a purpose that's not based in man's approval. You need to find a purpose that God has for you. And when you find that, you'll find complete contentment. I will guarantee you. Now, you I, I'm not going to say that all the lights are going to come on and, and it's going to be a spotlight from here to the end of your life. That's that, God's never promised that. But what I'm saying is you're going to find contentment to where you'll, you'll have something in your heart that will be beyond anything that you could ever imagine. Now, I'm going to say something real, real serious. And I'm just going to read what i got here. Listen to me. If you're thinking about or entertaining suicide, you come talk to me. I don't care if you're on the internet or if you're in this room. You come talk to me. Now, one thing i got to tell you up front is legally I have to let the authorities know what you're telling me. You have to understand that. But before you do that, I will pray with you. I will listen to you. I will help you find that the only help that you can get from God if you'll come talk to me about it. It won't be an appeal. It won't be in psychology. It'll be, you come talk to me. We'll look in God's Word and we'll find the answers that you need. I promise you that. Okay? I want to look at one more piece of Scripture and I'm going to quit. Turn with me over to chapter 20, uh, chapter 19, excuse me. I told you going to be an unusual message, didn't I? I'm all over the place. You'd think I was a scattergun. That's okay. Are you in chapter 19 yet? All right. Look with me in verse 22. Why do you persecute me as God and are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and led in a rock forever. For I know, now you listen here, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and that He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Stop just one minute. One of the things that we need to understand is Job understood that even though our troubles might be upon us, even though times might be hard, our Redeemer 
lives. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today, you have a personal relationship with the God of this universe, the one that can change things within a moment. My Redeemer lives. I don't serve some dead God made of stone. I don't serve some dead God made of metal. I serve a living, risen Savior. Today, my friend, wherever you find yourself, the Savior is alive. He is bidding you to come to Him. Maybe you need salvation. Maybe you just need a touch from God from heaven because you're down in the dumps. Whatever it is you need, He's there. And we can say, My Savior, my Redeemer liveth. He also said, I know without a shadow of a doubt, even though this body goes back to earth, one day this flesh will stand before my Redeemer again. We don't want to do nothing in this life that we'll have to give an account for in that day. Judgment's coming to all. Matter of fact, if we read the rest of that passage, we can see that judgment's coming. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today, I'm telling you, judgment is standing at the door waiting on you. If you don't get that thing right before you leave this earth, you will stand as He is your judge, not as your Redeemer. Amen. Again, I can't tell you enough, folks. Depression's real. Suicide's real. Bad things is real. Don't, you don't go through it by yourself. We ought to be a hospital. A hospital for the broken. Broken toys, folks. Everybody in here broke somehow or another. If you're like me, you broke it more than one way. Broke physically, broke financially. But no, I just pick it. But listen to me. We're broken toys. The church needs to be a hospital for broken toys. You hear me? If you're broken today, I'm telling you, your Redeemer will help you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone that's here. Lord, I thank you for this message. And I know it's just been all over the world, but God, I just feel like it's where you would have me to be today. So I feel like somebody needs it. Maybe a lot of somebody's. Father, may you take what's been said and through the Holy Spirit deal with hearts. Lord, some people need hope and need encouragement. Need to get their eyes off man and they need a good night's sleep. Father, I ask that you give that to them. Others need to be stirred in the Spirit and understand that there's a Redeemer that's one day going to be a judge and that He can even be the Redeemer now or the judge later. Father, for those that need to make a spiritual decision, I pray that You'll, you'll help them to do that. But whatever happens, I pray that You'll get the honor and glory for it. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.